Hello, this is Yashreen. In this video, I'll be solving paper 2, variant 2, 9700 biology gen 1. Phloem sap is transported from sources to sinks in phloem sieve tubes. Each sieve tube is constructed from phloem sieve tube elements. The structure of a phloem sieve tube element is adapted to its function. Each of the explanations from A to F describe how a particular structural feature of a phloem sieve tube element in a source is suited to the function of transporting phloem sap. The matching structural features of each explanation is listed in table 1.1. Um, so you have these letters a, a through F complete one table 1.1 by writing the correct letter from A to F in the last column of each row so that each structural feature is man, uh, matched to the correct explanation use each letter only once and the first row has been completed for you so the second row is that the end walls are perforated to form sieve plates as in there are gaps in the sieve plates to allow movement for the um, assimilates and that would match with C as it provides pores to allow flow of phloem sap from sieve, one sieve tube element to the next. There is a thin layer of cytoplasm around the edge of the cell and that decreases the resistance to the uh, flow of phloem sap within each sieve tube element so the spread of flow is maintained and this the resistance is also decreased by the fact that there are not many organelles in the phloem sieve tube element especially a large vacuum the cell is elongated and arranged end to end with other cells and that forms a, a and that is to form a very long tubular structure for the transport of phloem sap from source to sink. The cell has plasma desmata connecting to a uh, companion cell for entry of glucose and other organic compounds, which is A. For entry of sucrose and other organic compounds, which is A, as after active loading sucrose diffuses into the phloem sieve tube element. Uh, there is a thin cellulose cell wall which makes it easier for water to enter the phloem sieve tube element following the entry of sucrose which reduces the water potential. So this would match with B. At the sink, sucrose and other organic compounds are unloaded from phloem sieve tube element. Explain why the process of unloading helps the mass flow of phloem sap from the source to the sink. So the phloem sap, uh, the mass flow of phloem sap is caused due to difference in hydrostatic pressure and this difference or gradient is created between the source and the sink when one of, uh, when the sink has lower hydrostatic pressure and the source has greater hydrostatic pressure. So when sucrose and other organic compounds are unloaded from the sink, water is also removed from the sink and that decreases the volume of water and also decreases the hydrostatic pressure at sink and that means the hydrostatic pressure at a source becomes greater than the hydrostatic pressure at sink and therefore a gradient is created which causes mass flow. 2 phosphatidate phosphatase enzymes have an important role in lipid metabolism. The reaction catalyzed by PAP is shown in figure 2.1. So phosphatate, phosphatidate um, along with water is broken down to diglyceride and an inorganic phosphate. Experiments were carried out to investigate the activity of PAP extracted from the cotyledons of bitter guard, uh, Momordica carantia. So you are given the species, the genus and the species. A, there are two types of PAP enzymes, where PAP1 enzymes need magnesium ions in the active site to function, and PAP2 enzymes do not need magnesium ions. The effect of different concentrations of magnesium ion on the activity of PAP extracted from the bitter guard species was investigated. The, the results are shown in figure 2.2. So as you can see, the increasing the concentration of magnesium ion has little to no effect as it increases from uh, th around three units to some extent and then remains constant despite increasing concentration. Also initially when magnesium ion concentration was zero millimole per dm cube, the um, enzyme was still activated and working at 
um, around 30 units. Explain with reference to figure 2.2 whether PAP extracted from the species Twitter guard is a PAP1 or 2 enzyme. So it would be PAP2 enzyme since it um, does not require magnesium enzymes to function initially and does not show much of an increase in activity after the concentration of ions increases. B figure 2.3 shows the effect of increasing phosphatidate concentration on the activity of PAP extracted from M current. Yeah. So this graph shows so this graph shows the effect of increasing the substrate concentration on the enzyme activity. With reference to figure 2.3, describe and explain the effect of increasing phosphatidate concentration on the activity of PAP. In such sort of questions where you are supposed to describe and explain the graphs related to um, enzyme activity being linked with substrate concentration, I'd suggest that uh, you write down every single detail regarding uh, the mechanism of enzyme uh, re related to substrate, substrate concentration, and also write down um, major points about uh, describing the graph. Even though this question is only four marks, um, you never know what the marking scheme entails. Starting with the description, as you increase the substrate con concentration or of phosphatidate concentration, the enzyme activity increases, and it's it's it, and it's a fact that the increase in activity of an enzyme due to increasing substrate concentration is greatest initially because um, initially you have the greatest number of unoccupied sites, active sites, and then it, the increase in activity slows down. So the slope of the graph becomes less steep as you keep increasing the uh, substrate concentration. And that is so as you, because as you increase the substrate concentration, um, all of the unoccupied active sites start getting occupied or saturated with the substrate. And that means with time you have fewer and fewer uh, unoccupied active sites of the enzymes, which are supposed to form uh, enzyme substrate complex. Until if, and as you keep increasing substrate concentration, more and more enzyme substrate complex keep forming until eventually all of the active sites have been uh, occupied and the rate of reaction uh, remains the same. See, the diglycerides formed as a result of the action of PAP can be used to synthesize triglycerides and membrane phospholipids. One, explain how the structure of a triglyceride is suited to its function and as an energy storage molecule. Uh, because triglyceride is supposed to be stored as an energy storage, store it would be ideal if it gives a great amounts of energy which is uh, achieved by breaking the many carbon hydrogen bonds in its structure and it is also it also has a compact structure which makes it easier to be stored to explain why phospholipids are able to form a bilayer in cell membranes how the structure of uh, bilayer is maintained um, it is due to the nature of phospholipids, so they have a phosphate head, which is polar, and so it is able to form hydrogen bonds with the external environment of the cell and um, also inside the cell. And the fatty acid tails of the phospholipid are able to point towards each other and form the interior, which is um, hydrophobic in nature, and so it prevents movement of um, polar substances through the membrane. Three, during one cardiac cycle, the blood enters the heart from lungs and from the rest of the body through veins, and blood leaves the heart to be transported to the lungs and to the rest of the body through arteries. A, name the blood vessels that are entering the heart that bring blood from the rest of the body. So you're supposed to mention blood vessels more than one, and the two main uh, kind of those blood vessels would be superior and inferior vena cava. Superior from the upper region and inferior from the lower regions of the body. B. One phase of the cardiac cycle is ventricular diastole, where the ventricular uh, relaxation phase occurs. 
A number of events occur in, in the heart during this phase. Explain and outline in the events that occur in the heart during ventricular diastole. All right. So let me write down the events that occur in order so that we can describe and explain all of the events during this phase from the starting to the end. Okay. We start with ventricular systole. Right. Then you have the second stage would be atrial and ventricular diastole. Last but not least is atrial systole of the cardiac cycle. In the first one, the ventricles contract to pump blood out of the ventricles and into the arteries. In the second one, the atria and ventricles both relax to fill the heart with blood. And in the third one, the atria contract to pump any remaining blood in the atria into the ventricles so that the next cycle would start again with ventricles pumping all of the blood out of the heart. And we're supposed to we're supposed to explain the stage where ventricles relax. So ventricles relax in uh, during the during the last three stage uh, during the last two stages, as um, the second stage is diastole of ventricle and uh, ventricles and atria. In the last stage, atria um, contract, so they go through their systole, and ventricles are relaxed during the third stage as well. So we need to start with the second stage and end our answer with the last stage. Starting off, the atria and ventricles are relaxing. Following ventricle systole, the pressure ventricular systole requires pressure to uh, pressure in ventricles to force out blood into the arteries. And once this stage is finished, the pressure in ventricles falls falls down. And now normally blood would flow down the pressure gradient, and that would mean pressure from arteries would flow back into ventricles were it not for the fact that uh, semilunar valves close down. So at the starting of the second stage, semilunar valves close down as pressure in the ventricles falls. And during this stage, atria are also relaxing and they get filled with blood until up until the point that uh, pressure in atria again rises above the pressure in ventricles so that they would be able to contract in atrial systole of uh, the phase of cardiac cycle and fill the ventricles with blood. Now when the pressure of uh, atria becomes greater than the pressure in ventricles, we arrive at the third stage of the cycle, atrial systole, so the atria contract and fill ventricles with any remaining blood. For that to happen, atrioventricular walls between atria and ventricles would have to open up to allow the blood flow. Blood arriving in the lungs from the heart is oxygenated as it passes through the pulmonary capillaries. Sickle-shaped red blood cells are present in a person with sickle cell anemia. These cells have a very high quantity of abnormal sickle cell hemoglobin and take up and transport less oxygen than red blood cells containing normal hemoglobin. See the cause of difference, differences between sickle cell hemoglobin and normal hemoglobin is a mutation in the gene that codes for one of the two polypeptides found in hemoglobin molecule. So hemoglobin is a uh, globular protein consisting of four polypeptides and a person uh, suffering from sickle cell anemia, one of the polypeptides is altered which leads to um, sickle cell hemoglobin formation. This mutation leads to a change in the mRNA produced during the transcription causing a change in the primary structure of the polypeptide formed. So the nucleotide which codes for amino acids is changed and as a result the a change in amino acid sequence in the polypeptide occurs. Figure 3.1 shows some of the changes that occur as a result of this gene mutation. So you have triplet in a DNA strand which is transcribed triplet in DNA non-template strand mRNA codon formed using the triplet in a DNA template strand 
triplet strand in amino acids carried by the transfer RNA. One with reference to figure 3.1 state the base sequence of DNA triplet in P. P uh, the DNA triplet in P has to be complementary to its non-template uh, strand which is um, so the bases on this strand are GAC and its complementary DNA bases are CTC. Similarly, the bases, the base sequence of DNA triplet on Q or the, the bases on non-template strand of DNA have to be complementary to the template strand. So they would be G, T, G. And then you have uh, the base sequence of mRNA codon. So this codon is transcribed from the template strand and that means the bases on the mRNA have to be complementary to this base which is CAC and so its complementary RNA codon would be GUG. To name the type of polypeptide in a hemoglobin molecule that is different in sickle cell hemoglobin compared to normal hemoglobin. So the alteration occurs in the beta globin polypeptide of a hemoglobin molecule. D figure 3.2 shows the oxygen dissociation curve for adult hemoglobin in a person who does not have sickle cell anemia. Compared to figure 3.2, the oxygen dissociation curve for adult hemoglobin in a person with sickle cell anemia is shifted to the right, which is also the case for a, the oxygen dissociation curve in areas of um, high partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And that means uh, you can use Bohr's shift as a reference in your answer for this question. The uptake of oxygen by hemoglobin in the lungs and the release of oxygen by hemoglobin in respiring tissues is different in a person with sickle cell anemia compared with a person who does not have the disease. With reference to figure 3.2, state and explain these diff differences. So as I mentioned earlier, you can use um, the bar shift or the per oxygen dissociation curve at high partial pressures of carbon dioxide with, as your reference in this answer. So this graph represents the hemoglobin dissociation curve of a person suffering from sickle cell anemia. And as you can see, this graph represents that, uh, for example, at a partial pressure of oxygen, uh, 4 kilopascals, you'd have somewhere between 20 to 40 percentage uh, saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen in a person suffering from sickle cell anemia, whereas that of a normal hemoglobin would be somewhere between 40 to 60. As in, in a sickle cell hemoglobin, the percentage saturation would be lower, and that means the uptake of oxygen is lower. Similarly, the release of oxygen is going to be easier because um, sickle cell anemia hemoglobin would have lower affinity for oxygen, so it would be easier to for oxygen to dissociate from oxyhemoglobin. For a, when a section of lung tissue is viewed using a light microscope, it is possible to identify trachea, the bronchus, the bronchioles, and the alveoli. Other than dif the differences in their diameters, describe one structural difference between the trachea and bronchus. The cartilage in trachea are in the form of C-shaped cartilage, and whereas in the in bronchus they are present in the form of incomplete rings. A bronchus and a bronchiole. Bronchus does have cartilage whereas bronchiole does not have any. A bronchiole and an alveolus. A bronchiole has ciliated epithelium whereas an alveolus is only made up of squamous epithelium cells. So they do not have um, ciliated epithelium. The mitotic cell cycle of the stem cell present in the gas exchange system is carefully controlled during the interface of mitotic cell cycle. Cells grow by increasing in size, complete table 4.1 by listing in order the three phases that occur during the interface. So you have G1S phase, which is the DNA replication phase, and G2 phase. Stating one process other than growth and respiration that occurs in each of these three phases to help prepare for the cell uh, to help prepare the cell for mitosis. Starting with the G phase, it has protein synthesis occurs in this stage, which is used for growing spindle fibers in mitosis. And S phase is the semi-conservative DNA replication phase. So obviously you'd have DNA replication in this phase.
and during the G2 phase you'd have checkpoints that check for any error in the new uh, DNA that has been produced after application. 5. Methanian gravis and HIV or AIDS both involve disorders of the immune system. A outline why Methanian gravis is described as a disorder of the immune system. Methanian gravis, as you know, is an autoimmune disease where the immune system carries out an immune response against the body's own antigens um, by mistaking them for non-self antigens because it is not capable of distinguishing between the two particularly for Mesthenia gravis it, it is the, T, the helper T cells that is responsible for the immune response A person with HIV or AIDS has a weakened immune system this is because HIV infects cells of the immune system in particular the helper lymphocytes the pathogen can remain inactive within host cells. In some people, the pathogen becomes active and causes the number of helper T lymphocytes cells to decrease. Antiretroviral therapy is used to treat people who are infected with HIV or linked with the virus. ART aims to keep the number of T helper lymphocytes at a healthy level. B state the full name of the pathogen known as HIV and that would be human immunodeficiency virus. C. Explain why it is important that ART maintains a healthy number of T cells in a person living with HIV. In other words, this question is asking for the importance of um, helper T lymphocytes or why they are required in the body. What would happen if they were not present? T helper lymphocytes carry immune response by secreting cytokines that not only stimulate um, B lymphocytes to um, secrete antibodies faster, but they also, the cytokines also stimulate phagocytes to carry out phagocytosis um, more rapidly. And that means if helper D lymphocytes were not present, cytokines would not be released and B lymphocytes would not form plasma cells to secrete antibodies, nor would they form memory cells. And so the person could can uh, not achieve long-term immunity. It also means that macrophages would not be activated to perform phagocytosis faster. The figure 5.1 shows global estimates of the percentage of people living with HIV who received um, treatment with ART in each year from 2000 to 2015 and that is represented by the shaded bars and also the number of people who died from HIV AIDS in each year from 2000 to 2015 and that is represented by this black line over here and they vary inversely the number of people with uh, living with HIV who receive treatment uh, increases with time and the number of deaths from the disease decreases after increasing first one describe the trends shown in figure 5.1 so you can describe the increase of uh, people with people with the disease who have received the treatment and for the number of deaths you can mention how it increases and then decreases and for the third mark you can quote some data from the graph It is recommended that ART is given to all people living with HIV. Some countries that report this recommendation find it difficult to provide ART to everyone living with HIV. Other than the high cost of treatment suggests two reasons why it is difficult to provide ART to everyone living with HIV. Everyone living with HIV may, might not be showing symptoms. They might be a symptomless carrier and so they might not be diagnosed. Also, the ART might not be supplied to people all around, all around the world in the area of wherever they are living by whoever provides them health facilities. Six, figure 6.1 is a transmission electron micrograph of a plant parenchyma cell. The external environment of the parenchyma cell has a higher water potential than the internal environment of the cell due to all of the um, solutes that are present in mainly the vacuole of the plant cell. 
One function of the parent gamma cells is to sub provide support to the plant by target pressure of the vacuole mainly. With reference to figure 6.1 suggests how parent gamma cells provide support to the plant. The, the hint for the answer is given in the question as we are told that higher water potential uh, that the cell has a lower water potential than its environment. That means water would move into the cell by osmosis and vacuole would get filled with water and exert pressure on the walls of the plant cell providing turgor pressure which in turn provides support to the plant. B the image shown in figure 6.1 is at a higher magnification than can be obtained using a typical light microscope. One explain what is meant by the term magnification. So you write down the definition of magnification in here, which is the number of times an image is greater than the object itself. The actual diameter of the parent gamma cell in figure 6.1 along the line xy is 35 micrometers. Calculate the magnification of the image. So use the formula magnification is equal to image size or actual size. And the image size should be 70,000 micrometers. And then you divide that with the actual um, actual size, which is 35 micrometers. To get the answer as 2,000 times magnified. To get both of the marks for this answer, you will have to write down the step which you use to get the answer. The cell type and vacuole of cell shown in figure 6.1 has a pH of 5, so it is acidic in nature. The cytosol has a pH of 7.2, so the cytoplasm has an a, a close to alkaline nature and that means there's a difference of um, hydrogen ion concentration between the vacuole and cytoplasm vacuole having a greater concentration of hydrogen ion which causes acidic nature the tonoplast controls the passage of hydrogen ions from the cytosol into the vacuole the low pH created by the entry of hydrogen ions is optimum for the action of acid hydrolase enzymes in the vacuole that means the enzymes in the vacuole have a have an optimum pH close to an acidic pH. Acid hydrolase enzymes are also find, found in lysosomes in animal cells. So the lysosomes in animal cells would also have an acidic would also have acidic environment. One suggest which transport mechanism is used to move hydrogen ions from the cytosol of the parent gamma cells into the vacuole and explain your choice. Now because the um, vacuole has a lower pH than in the cytoplasm itself, that means there is a higher concentration of hydrogen ions in the vacuole. And to move hydrogen ions from an area of lower concentration from the cytoplasm to an area of greater concentration in the vacuole against the concentration gradient would mean the transport mechanism is active transport and for the explanation part you can mention all of the characteristics of active transport using its definition. To suggest how the structure of tonoplast allows hydrogen ions to be transported into the vacuole but does not allow the ions to leave the vacuole. Now this um, active transport is a is an active um, transport mechanism meaning that it requires protein membranes in the tonoplast and that means hydrogen molecules would have to bind with the protein molecules to be transported and the hydrogen ions have to fit into the binding site to be transported and if the transport is only one way that means there's only a binding site on the protein that is outside the vacuole and not the side which is inside. Three, the acid hydrolysis in the vacuole cannot function in neutral conditions or alkaline conditions. Explain the advantage to the plant cell of having acid hydrolysis that cannot function in neutral, near neutral or alkaline conditions. The, uh, that means acid hydrolysis would only be able to function in the vacuole or in lysosomes which also means that if they do end up leaking out of these structures they would not be able to function because if they were able to function they would have digested they would have performed unwanted digestion which could be breaking down organelles or unwanted substances so that is that works to the advantage of the plant itself
as uh, anywhere outside of the lysosomes and vacuole would be a pH of neutral and that would denature or partially denature the enzyme. And this is it. We are done with this paper. Thank you for watching.